Good morning. It is so good to be here with everybody. So thankful that you are here as we come together uh, to worship our God together. Uh, I got a few uh, who we need to be praying for, so I'll let you know of them. I'll be praying for Dave Sweeney. He had a successful hip uh, replacement surgery last week, and now he's at home recovering. So pray for him as he recovers. Also, Chip Holt will have cataract surgery on his eye Tuesday and the other eye on Thursday. And then Toby Jones, who is Harbor and, uh, sorry, Herb and Barbara Jones' grandson, was taken Wednesday night to Vanderbilt Children's Hospital with an infection, and they're hoping to have uh, him into a regular room Friday. And so uh, pray uh, for him and the family as they go throughout that. Um, got a few announcements that I would like to make note of. Uh, you might notice that, that some, actually at this service, you might not notice a whole lot. There's a reason I'm up here, I'll say at least that, that, that uh, the, the fall retreat is going on uh, at this time. And so they should be getting back pretty much after our 11 o'clock service this morning. And so uh, I'm excited to have my wife and daughter back and uh, we'll have uh, some of the youth back and, and Andy and them. Uh, and also, Last Leaders uh, is planning on going on uh, on uh, April 1st through the 4th of 2021. Uh, one of the changes this year is that they're opening registration a month early. So if you would like a hotel room, please let Jennifer Miller know by November 1st, 2020. As in uh, years past, uh, we have uh, a block of rooms reserved. Uh, and so this will be the first come, first serve basis. And you need to contact Jennifer directly uh, if you're wanting uh, to, to reserve one of those rooms. We're estimating the room cost will be $160. $65 per night. Uh, that's all that I have for our announcements this morning. If you'll bow with me, let's go ahead and begin with a prayer. Our dear Father, we're so thankful for all that you bless us with. Our God, we're thankful for this time where we could be together. As we focus now on the worship that we're entering into, God, we pray that we'll make a concentrated effort to express to you how much we love you, how much we appreciate you, God, you have blessed our lives in so many ways. You've given us hope and peace. You've been gracious and merciful to us. God, you are a God above all gods, and we're so thankful for the God that you are and your love uh, that you express to us, not only in this life, but also in that which is to come. We pray that as we enter into this worship, we'll focus on you, our love and devotion to you, and we'll express to you our gratitude. God, we pray that you'll be pleased and glorified by our time together this morning. We love you, and it's through your son that we pray. Amen. Amen. Our first song this morning will be Faith is the Victory, number 134. Faith is the Victory.
this morning, we'll be singing number 215, Hear Me When I Call, 215. <clears throat> in prayer and have our scripture reading. Our reading this morning is taken from Acts, the 23rd chapter, verses 12, and beginning with verses 12 and through verse 22. And when it was day, certain of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under a curse, saying that we would either, neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. And they were more than 40 which had made this conspiracy. And they came to the chief priests and elders and said, We have bound ourselves under a great curse that we will eat nothing until we have slain Paul. Now therefore, ye with the Council signified to the chief captain that he bring him down unto you uh, to, tomorrow as though you would inquire something more perfectly concerning him. And we or ever he come near are ready to kill him. And when Paul's sister's son heard of their lying in wait, he went and entered into the castle and told Paul, and Paul called one of the centurions unto him and said, uh, uh, Bring this young man unto the chief captain, for he hath a certain thing to tell him. And so he took him and brought him to the chief captain and said, Paul the prisoner called me unto him and prayed, and prayed me to bring this young man unto thee, who hath something to say unto thee. Then the chief captain took him by the hand and went with him aside privately and asked him, What is that thou hast to tell me? And he said, The Jews have agreed to desire thee that thou wouldst bring down Paul uh, tomorrow unto the council, as though they were, would inquire somewhat of him more perfectly. But do not thou yield unto them, for their they lie in wait for him, of, of them more than forty men, which have bound themselves with an oath that they will neither eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now are they ready, looking for a promise from thee? So the chief captain then let the young man depart and charged them, See thou tell no man that thou hast showed these things to me. Let's go to God in prayer. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we approach your throne this morning, and we thank you for this wonderful day that you've given to us, this opportunity to gather together as a family and to praise and to learn more about you. We ask that this worship is acceptable in your sight and that we are blessed as a result of it. Lord, through this trying time, we ask that you be with us as a church, as a country, Lord, that you be with our leaders. We thank you for giving us your word that we know how to live our lives. And most of all, Lord, we thank you for the gift of your son. And it's through his name that we pray. Amen. As we prepare our minds this morning for the Lord's Supper, uh, we will sing Christ, we do all adore thee. Number 90 in your book, Christ, we do all adore thee. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Jesus knew that we are utterly unworthy of his kingdom. And out of his love for us, he gave himself. He was beaten, abused, endured scorn in order for us to be saved and to be given hope to inherit his kingdom one day. Would you bow with me? Heavenly Father, we bow before you, thanking you, Father, for the wonderful love that your son shared with us at the cross, Father. We thank you for his body, for the beating and abuse that he endured, and for the hope that he gives us through salvation. It is through his name that we pray. Amen. Would you bow with me again? Heavenly Father, again we come before you, thanking you again for your Father, Son, the blood that he shed for us at Calvary, Father. We thank you that it washes us clean of our sin and gives us hope that we may one day live with you, Father. It is through his name that we pray, amen.
This concludes the Lord's Supper. Uh, the elders have deemed this an appropriate time to partake of our, author, of our offering, which we typically would do if we weren't under COVID protocols. But um, on the PowerPoint slide back here, we should have our QR code and the website and the app and text number um, to have our offering. And we also have the box at the back um, on the table in the foyer. Would you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the wonderful blessing that Southern Hills is as a congregation, Father. We pray that you please help us to continue to be fruitful, to further your kingdom, Father, through the works that we're able to do at this congregation. Again, Father, thank you so much for your son and the sacrifice he gave on our part. It's through his name that we pray. Amen. Our invitation song this morning will be Trust and Obey, number 714. If you're using your book and would like to mark that, number 714. Before our lesson this morning, though, we're going to sing My Hope is Built on Nothing Less, number 438. And I would ask if you're able, please stand with me. your Bibles, I would encourage you to open up to 1 Timothy. And I'll say this while you're turning there. 1 Timothy, I think, is for a minister, should be a special book, right? It's kind of God's divine job description for ministers. Sometimes there are things that come up and, and a minister will ask, okay, how do I handle that? And I think that during an election cycle, uh, such as the one we're living in, it's one of those, right? What lessons do you preach? Uh, what do you talk about? The uh, truth is, there's probably a lot of things that should be talked about in a time like this. And, and as, as election cycles come and go, it's kind of unique, the situation we're in. As far as world history goes, not a lot of people have had the option of choosing who their leader is, right? Or choosing their, we know that we don't go by king, but choosing their king or president or whatever, not a lot of people get that option, but we do, right? And so I, I, I struggle sometimes with what do you say 
What, what types of things do you highlight? And I'll just go ahead and, and let you guys know uh, that we're probably going to talk about similar things this week and next week uh, as, as we lead up to election day. Okay. And so I wonder like, what do you talk about? And I'll just be honest. Like I worry about some things. Like I worry sometimes that we can become like so politically motivated that we lose to a degree an understanding of, of godliness, right? I, I look through scripture and I look through some of the things that, that people do when it comes to politics and I see not really a match, right? You read through Romans 13, you read through 1 Peter chapter 2, we'll talk from uh, second, or sorry, 1 Timothy chapter 2, and, and there's a respect that is to be shown to those who are in charge, those who are your rulers, those who have authority, and I wonder sometimes if, if we show respect to those we don't agree with. You know, and, and, and I wonder sometimes if in the way we talk and in, in the way we address people and speak of people who are in the political group that we don't affiliate ourselves with, if, if we're still respectful. And, and sometimes, quite frankly, we're not. And, and that's a problem. On the other hand, I think that sometimes when there are people who we are in agreement with politically, we almost overlook some of the faults and almost elevate certain individuals and certain political people to a position that, that quite frankly, I, I think we should be uncomfortable with. Uh, and, and so like you got this, like where we can become so politically motivated that, that we lose kind of our, our lines of right and wrong. And we can kind of lose and, and blur those lines a little bit. And, and, and maybe those who, because they agree with us politically, we act like they're a little better than they actually are. And, and, and those who we disagree with politically, we're, we're disrespectful and rude and mean, right? And, and neither one of those things is what, what God wants from us. On the other hand, I think what can happen is that we can become so... I guess, disenchanted with politics that, that we don't use what, well, quite frankly, is, is a blessing. And, and that is a privilege we have in, in, in the political system we have to be able to impact some way uh, the world we live in, right? The truth is this, and, and we'll see in our study today, uh, while we shouldn't trust and put our hope and our faith in politics, to a large degree, it does impact our lives. It does. And we'll see that in our study today. Like, there's no doubt that what happens in the political landscape and, and you know, when we select a president, now, that's going to impact the life of a Christian. It's going to. And so the question is, like, what do we do about it? And, and how do we handle this? And, and so I mentioned earlier that I love First Timothy because it's almost like this job description for ministers. And as a matter of fact, Timothy would write, I'm sorry, Paul would write to Timothy in chapter three and verse 14, and he tells them why he's writing. He says, I'm writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long, but in case I am delayed, I rise so that you will know how you ought to conduct or how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. Truth is, he's talking about ministers there. How is the minister to conduct himself in the household of God? What's he supposed to do? A few verses later in chapter four and verse six, he says, if you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Jesus Christ or of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of good doctrine that you have followed. And so he's telling Timothy, okay, these are the things you teach. This is what, what you tell people to do. This is how you instruct brethren to behave. And if you do that, you'll be a good servant. All right. And I want to be a good servant of Jesus Christ. And so I look and say, okay, what should I teach about this? And when it comes to like this political landscape, he actually has something to say. Not that they lived in, in the exact uh, political landscape we do, right? They, they, they had a much more oppressive, 
uh, government. Uh, they actually, he's writing to Timothy, who was in Ephesus, and Ephesus was kind of controlled by Rome, and Rome was very powerful. Nero was the king at the time, and he was no friend of Christians, right? And so, like, it was this really hard time for them in dealing with their government. And our, our situation is different, right? They didn't ever get a vote. Uh, they, they never get to choose who, you know, the Caesar was going to be or anything, but, but we do to some degree, and so while it's different, there's a lot of similarities in that the way we are to respond and treat our governments is always the same. And so what is it that Timothy is supposed to instruct the brethren about? What is it that the church, how is it that we are supposed to interact with? Or what are we supposed to do for those who are in authority? This is what he says. So if you have your Bibles open to 1 Timothy chapter 2, he starts by saying this. First of all, then, I urge the supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. Okay, so he says all people, but in just a moment, he's going to narrow in on who he's really wanting to address. And that is kings and those who are in authority. And he says, what do you need to do? What should the brethren be doing? Supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving. Now, interestingly, those are four different words, but they all kind of have to do with prayer. Right? And, and, and we'll narrow in on this more in just a moment. But if you look at them kind of individually, supplication is, is kind of like a request. And so when you go before God in prayer, you're requesting something of God. He says prayer, which is the word we use. It's just kind of the general word for speaking to God. Now, prayer can be a prayer of thanksgiving. It could be a prayer of supplication. It could be a prayer of intercession. Like there's different types of prayers. It's just kind of that general word for praying. He says intercessions. And on intercessions, we're talking about praying for people specifically. To intercede for somebody. To ask God to do something on this person's behalf. Not for myself. I might ask God supplications for myself. But intercessions is more like, I, I want to pray for these people. It says, and thanksgivings. So when we ask God, we speak to God, we intercede for God. Like we need to be making sure that we're also thankful to God. And we speak thanksgiving to God. Okay, so he narrows in more specifically on who he wants those prayers to go for. He says, for kings and all who are in high position. Okay, so we recognize we don't have a king, right? We do have a president and, and we have people in high position. And what does God want us to do? He wants us to give supplications and prayers and intercessions and thanksgivings. And that's, that's God's word on the matter. That's what God wants. Like right now is we're, we're heading into this time of, of election. Like the, the truth is this, like we need to be praying people. Like, like we have some supplications, right? Are there things that, that we need to ask of God in this time? I, I think obviously. Like I, I've pointed out, I, like I, I worry sometimes that, that we look at the political landscape and, and we'll be disrespectful and mean to one. And, and we look at the other side, and sometimes we're like overboard on, on like, I think elevating them higher than we should. But, but the truth is this in reality. We recognize that, that we live in a time where the political landscape is very much divided. And, and it's divided in a lot of different ways. And those ways impact us. And those ways impact what is right and wrong. 
I'll, I'll be honest, like I, I, th- there are issues that, that take place. And I think we make a huge mistake in thinking of them as political issues. I, you think of subjects like abortion, for example. Like this, that's not a Republican Democrat issue, guys. God spoke on that long, long, long time ago. God has always been against taking of innocent life. And that's something that, that, that should prick the heart of every Christian. I believe it's it, like, if you want, if you were to ask me like the greatest sin of our people, like the stain that's like, we live in a place where we allow the murder of innocent children. Guys, that's wrong. It is. I don't say that with animosity in my heart. I, I, I don't like, but, but like, it's wrong. If, if you read through scripture, if, if you read, just, just read scripture and see what, what seems to, re, if we could put it in human terms, what really seems to get under the skin of God, it's when you hurt people who can't stand up for themselves. You, you read through scripture, you read about like how Israel fell and it'll be like rich people taking advantage of poor people. Why? Because they can, they're more powerful. It's things like not caring for the widows. Why? <laughs> if you're just not taking care of those who need help. It's about not taking care of the fatherless or the orphan. Like, like God is angered by his people not helping those who are weak. Like, and I, I can think of no one weaker. No one who needs more help than an innocent child. Like, guys, we need to be praying about that. Be asking God, God, help us to get rid of this sin. Like this sustained us. Like hopefully not us as like, like I don't believe I'm guilty of, but like like this has stained our nation. And our prayers need to be that God get rid of this. And and that's not the only thing. I mean, there, there, there's sins, and I'll be honest, there's sins on which I don't know that there's a side that's right. You know, when you talk about like the home and you talk about the, 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 the respect for the home, like, like I, don't, I don't know that there's any side that really respects God's view of and, and design of the home the way they should. And, and I pray that, that, that we can, as a nation, as a people, start to appreciate the value of the home more so than we do. I, I, I got, I got <laughs> supplication, just prayers, God. And sometimes what happens when you look at, like you feel insignificant and you feel small, like you see all this stuff that's going on around us and you want to do something, but sometimes I don't feel like there's much I can do. So I pray. And I ask God, God, there's sin all around us all around us. And, and, and I want my God and, and ask my God to help. He says prayers for kings in high position. Interesting. And guys, I, I think I pointed out earlier when, 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 Paul, when Paul wrote this to Timothy, the king he was talking about was not necessarily somebody that they liked. I'm just wondering because like when, when, when I, I see a lot of things about people asking for prayers for the political leaders they like. I don't know how often I see people asking for political leaders to people they don't like. Like, I, I, don't, I don't know how often I see people saying like, hey, let's pray for, and, and I don't want to start throwing names because I don't want to like 
but like, we'll say like prayers for Trump and prayers for Biden, right? Are we praying for both? Or do we kind of pick and choose and say, okay, we're only going to pray for the people that we want to pray for. No, all who are in high position, pray for all of them. Like, I, like, I don't know who's going to be elected here in, in a week and a half. I don't know who's going to be our president next year, but I know this. No matter who it is, the church should be praying for that person. He says, intercessions. Like, pray for those people. Intercede for those people. Like, you pray on their behalf that they would be who they should be, that, that they would lead the way they should lead, that they would have wisdom and understanding, and you pray for them. He says, uh, and thanksgivings. And so, like, I'm just thinking, like, like we point out, like, our world is far from perfect, like, I think that we have things in our nation. I know that we have things in our nation that God is just extremely displeased with. I know that because I know my God and I know the things that's happening. And, and I know that God's displeased with a lot of these things. But at the same time, there are things that God has granted us. God has, in a lot of ways, blessed us as a people. I think of the fact that, you know, here we are. And we've all come together this morning. And, and we're worshiping without fear of anyone coming in, breaking down the doors and hauling us off to jail. We're praying without fear that anyone come in, break down the doors and kill us. All right? We, we actually even live stream our sermons and put it out there on Facebook, hoping as many people as will listen, will listen. And as many people as will tune in, will t- like if you recognize our world and their, like that's different. They were not able to do that. They weren't. Christians were killed. Christians were imprisoned. Christians were beat. You just look at the life of Paul and you have a Christian who's been you know, beat and, and imprisoned, ultimately killed for his faith. And, and, and I recognize like I've never done that. Like I've never had that fear. Sure, I've had maybe some people say some things that aren't the nicest. I, I've, I've might've been degraded in a way, you know, but like, for the most part, I really haven't suffered the way he suffered. And, and we need to be thankful for that. We ask God all the time for freedoms. But do we express our gratitude for the freedoms that we do have? And, and that's what he wants. And what's interesting is that he tells us why he wants us to pray. All right, he says, first of all, then, I urge the supplications, prayers, intercessions, thanksgiving, made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Do you recognize that God's intention for the church, what God wants for his people is that they could live in a God or a a quiet and peaceful life. I mentioned like, we're not really in fear. Like they were in fear. We're not being imprisoned and beat and killed. Like that's what God wants. Sometimes we'll say things like maybe what the church needs is, is some more persecution and that'll get us like, that's not what God wants. God doesn't want his people being persecuted. As a matter of fact, I think we'll find that the church should be stronger when it's not. I've heard a lot of people say the church is stronger when the church is persecuted. And I don't think, I don't think scripture really teaches that. Maybe a select few people, you know, but, but for the most part, God's intention and God's desire is that the church would not be persecuted. God wants the church to live peaceful and quiet, but God also wants the church to live godly and dignified. 
Though both of those phrases, godly and dignified, have to do with respect, right? Godliness is about a respect towards God. Dignity is like a respect towards what is right. And, and God wants that. But what happens is that while I'm required to live a godly and dignified way, the way I'm received for doing that is vastly different sometimes. Paul lived a godly and dignified way, but he did not live peacefully and quietly. He was beat and imprisoned and killed because of it. God wants us to live godly and dignified with great respect to him and with great respect to what is right. But sometimes that brings about war and violence and meanness. But God wants it to bring about quietness and peaceful life. That's what God wants. And that's what we should be praying for that I can live my godly and dignified life and have peace and quietness, not violence and meanness and imprisonments and death. He goes on to say, this is good. And it is pleasing in the sight of God, our savior. That's what God wants Why does God want that? Because God desires all people to be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. So there's two things that I'm thinking about when I read this right now. I'm thinking about the fact that, one, God wants all people to be saved. You know who that includes? Republicans and Democrats. That includes, that includes President Trump and Joe Biden. That includes everybody. I, I hope we feel the same. That, that we want all people to be saved and all people to come to a knowledge of the truth. But I'm also thinking this. I, I, and I, I'm concerned a little bit about it, if I'm just going to be honest. Sometimes we'll say things, and I mentioned this a moment ago, that in times of persecution, the church gets stronger. I don't know that I agree with that 100%, but I do, I do know this is true. That sometimes when there's peace and, and there's quietness of life, we can get very comfortable. I know that's true that we can get so comfortable in our lives that we don't do anything. That God desires all people to be saved and all people to come to a knowledge of the truth. But I'm just, you know, I'm comfortable, man. There's no persecution. There's nothing. And so I'm not really working towards that end. Like what God wants is his people to live in quietness and peace. But while they're living in quietness, like getting the message out there so people could come to a knowledge of the truth without being killed for it. Like I, I, like I have friends, I have a friend uh, and uh, he, he lives in India. I actually went to preaching school with him. His name is Mani Anand Pagadapali. I love saying his name, but like he's a friend of mine. I can't tell you how many times I hear news that he baptizes someone. And so they're like ostracized by their family. Or he teaches someone the knowledge of the truth. And so like they're, they're, they're put out by their, you know, their community. Or even several times people come to truth and they're killed for it. They've had people burned. They've had people killed when they come to the truth. And yet they still come to the truth. And, I, and, I, and, I, and I, I see that. And I know that that's God's ultimate plan is that people come to a knowledge of the truth. But shouldn't, shouldn't we be even more diligent about it? Knowing that coming to the truth probably doesn't mean getting killed right now. It probably doesn't mean losing your job. 
Now, I mean, honestly, if, if, if you come to God and, and you come to righteousness and you start to live a godly and a dignified way, truth is there might be some things that change and alter about your family structure. There might be some things that change and alter about your life, but you're probably not going to be imprisoned. And yet, sometimes we don't even share it. We've gotten too comfortable. I guess what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is this. It's, it's an election cycle. I don't know what will happen. I know what God wants. God wants everyone to be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. That's what God wants. And as a Christian, as a child of God, my biggest concern should be that very thing. So I should pray with supplications, prayers, intercession, thanksgiving, excuse me, thanksgiving, that God would give us the peace and the tranquility of life so that we can share with people the truth and they could come to the truth and in doing so still live a peaceful and quiet life. Let's pray for it. Let's work for it. Let's make sure that God's goal is our goal. And if you will, let's pray right now for that very thing. Our dear Father, we're thankful because we know that you have blessed us in our life. God, we recognize that throughout our lives, we haven't suffered the way some have. God, when we look at people like the Apostle Paul, like Timothy, like Peter, and, and, and all the apostles and, and, and so many other Christians who suffered so much as they were diligent about bringing people to the knowledge of truth, about bringing, bringing people the knowledge of you that would result in their salvation. God, we're thankful for their diligence and their dedication. God, there are people today who live in parts of the world where they have very similar type things going on. I pray for us in our nation. We're coming up to a part, or a time, a place where we cast a vote. And I don't know what's going to happen. My God, I ask that whatever happens, it will be something that results in, in your word being followed more closely, people having more opportunity to hear from you. God, I pray that whatever happens, that, that we will be people who live godly and dignified. I, I ask for a quiet and peaceful life for myself and, and, and for the church today and for our children and grandchildren. And I pray that that life will result in more and more and more people coming to a knowledge of the truth, being saved from their sins, and glorifying you. God, I'm so thankful for the life you've blessed me with and the life that you've blessed us all with, and we pray that we use our lives for your glory. We love you, and it's through your son that we pray. Amen. If there's anybody in here this morning who's not yet a Christian, who doesn't know what the truth is about salvation, we would love to sit down and talk with you, discuss with you, open up God's word, study it with you. If there's something we can do this morning to help you obey that, if we can pray for you, if we can uh, teach you further, if we can baptize you this morning, we would love to help you in any way that we can uh, as you strive to know more about God and follow his word more closely. If there's anything we can do, we give you this opportunity to sit on one of the front rows while we stand and sing the song of invitation. When we walk with the
Thank you all for being here this morning and worshiping with us. It is always a good thing to be together, and I think we appreciate that more now than we have in the past. So thank you for being here and encouraging each other with me today. Before we are dismissed in one final prayer, we will, we will sing Sweet Hour of Prayer, number 618, Sweet Hour of Prayer. Sweet Hour of Prayer. in prayer our father in heaven we're so very thankful for the beginning of a new week and we're thankful for the great and well-timed lesson from brother Garrett this morning father our, our nation is in protest that's all we see nowadays and it's my prayer this morning that those protests turn into prayers supplications and intercessions and thanksgiving to you father help this nation in its leadership know that all souls matter. In your son's name we pray, amen.